So should I set the start perhaps? And there's some time. Um, this might be a long lecture. So. Um, where did I begin? So yeah, as mentioned, my name is Thais Gorbe, I'm also living in Norwegian. Um, my background is in philosophy, but I've done a lot of meditation research uh, in the last years, and I specialize in what's sometimes called first-person methods. Uh, Microphenomenology, for instance, which uh, consists of um, studying how people experience things, anything, um, based on their experience. So, for instance, when I investigate meditation, I would talk to people, expert meditators, about their experiences, or go into the practices myself and study them systematically, reporting on those experiences. So, it's kind of, it's not an um, external way to look at these things. And yeah, this is the first time I'm going to talk about magic. Um, I'm doing a research project now on expert meditators about their experiences with deep states, sometimes called the jhanas, stages of contemplative development, awakening experiences, but also um, their experiences with the, what's sometimes called the cities, the magical powers that appear. And this is something that's also started to appear in my own meditation practice, and I'm going to share something about that uh, towards the end of this talk. Okay, so I'll go to the slides. Um, that man is a meditating mage. It's from the Gwent card game. Uh, that's where I got the title. And the interesting thing is that if you you'll find this, let's say, archetype of a connection between you know, focusing the mind and developing special abilities in popular culture as well. So we have uh, Baby Yoda, Grogu, gathering the force, um, collecting his energy to develop those magical abilities. There's the Scarlet Witch doing some dream walking, uh, basically accessing another reality through some kind of astral protection. And related, here we have the Strange looking into the future, doing this mudra. This is often how you sort of recognize it, how people hold their hands. You know? I'm sure you've seen this. But you can also go to reality um, to find something quite magical. This is a Tibetan monk in a deep meditation state. It's called Tukta, which is a state you can go into at the moment of death. So it's said that at the moment of death, you go for a specific dissolution process and you land up in something called clear light. If you take the clear light as your meditation object, you can disrupt the death process. So if you look into what happens in this monk's brain, it's called Tenga Rinpoche, by the way, you won't find anything. This has been tested. There's no EEG readings there. For the body doesn't decompose. Um, for a few days, the week, even more. And the idea is that you can break the cycle of rebirth um, through this kind of practice, or even decide where you want to do, come back, so to speak, and uh, spread the Dharma. And this is a typical how you would discover or, or come across meditation today. Um, this part has been removed. Um, it's been a process of secularization of meditation at least how it's usually presented. Um, and recently, people have started to also go to these uh, magical aspects of, of meditation practice. There are a few books. One on the left is uh, actually uh, quite old. It's a woman, Alexander David Neal, who went to Tibet to document some of the, the practices, for instance, some people who would run for days through the night in some kind of trance state. In the middle, we have what we call uh, Buddhist magic, it's about uh, spells in the Tibetan tradition. And then you have uh, the Buddhist wizards, which is about the, the Vaisas, which are Buddhist uh, magicians. And there's a quote uh, Vaisa is any human being who has a permit or lay, who has gained supernatural powers and transformed him or herself into a semi divine being through specific practices 
agalgamy and manipulation of Kabbalistic squares uh, or master clustering sacred verses. And um, this use, the practices of meditation again the skills, but also to sort of help spread the Dharma and the uh, South Analysis. So it's very much integrated um, in this tradition. This is Theravada uh, Buddhist with Dharma. And we find this in the old suttas as well. This is from uh, one sutta where we have the four, uh, the six cities, the six powers. Power of transformation would include, for instance, putting your hand on the wall, flying, and then you start to read the minds of others. And up until um, gaining the power of extinction of suffering, which is staying in Buddhism as well, not I'm sure. But here you can see that um, magic and awakening, enlightenment practices are very much integrated. So it's, it's basically a scale where the end of the magical practice would be the complete end of suffering, um, which would be quite magical, I'd say. Um, a quick look at the Christian tradition. So I'm sure you're also aware there are a lot of miracles in the Bible. The seven signs of Jesus consist of signs that Jesus made to his disciples to strengthen their faith. Um, the most famous one is walking on the water. You can see a depiction of that uh, on your right. Uh, I didn't know that, but you see, you see there are two figures there. The one going towards the light beam is Peter. So the disciples apparently also get these magical abilities. Um, and yeah, if you go to the Christian tradition, you'll find uh, such abilities also among the saints in particular. Here is um, a quote by Teresa of Avila. Uh, it's from her biography, I think. Uh, and she says that basically, when she goes into deep meditation states, she sometimes starts to fly. That's how it's reported. And this was somehow maybe even embarrassing. And she had them instructed the nuns to keep her on the floor when this happened. Um, and there are more um, examples of this. You know, the, the classical picture would be you know, the flying witch. There's a book here on that, Women Who Fly. It's, it's probably one of my, my favorite titles for a book, Goddesses, Witches, Mystics, and Other Airborne Females. But we also have airborne males. This, this is uh, Father Cupertino, who started flying. And uh, I'm not sure if he do it on purpose or if he just sort of lift it on the, off of the ground, so to speak. But this is also reported by uh, other saints, uh, Francis of Sisi, for instance. Father Cupertino was a Franciscan monk, by the way. So these things are reported. You'll find it. Um, if you start looking, it's not that rare, actually. Uh, also, if you go to the Tibetan tradition, tradition you can find out uh, the references is what's known for flying. So this is just an example, or different examples, of mystics that develop magical abilities. And I'm going to go to walk towards the, the, the mages um, and their use of meditation, perhaps. And it's a bit difficult to trace the sources of that. Um, but if you go to the Neoplatonic tradition, I think you can find something. So this is Plotinus. He had the idea that we have developed from the One. The One has emanated the world of spirit and the world of the soul. And then comes the human being who transforms around and goes back to the One. And this, I think, if you look into Plotinus, you'll find that this is a kind of meditation practice. Maybe, maybe based on Initially, it led to uh, activity, you know, philosophizing, but, but then transforming into silence and becoming one with the light and so on. Um, magic was also very much a part of the Greek world, and uh, there are reports of Plotinus being attacked by a magician. And Plotinus was quite dismissive about magic, so he didn't do any of those practices. But apparently, just through this you know, philosophizing, spiritual activity, there was some magical protection that developed around him, so this 
magician that attacked them actually got the spell back and stopped. Um, but yeah, so here you'll find some kind of spiritual practice at least, maybe not magical, but you'll find this in the later Neoplatonics. This is Iamblichus, um, one of, I guess you could say, the fathers of theurgy, magical practice connecting to the divine world, and there are also reports of him flying. Uh, Iamblichus was reported by his servants to levitate more than 10 cubits and take on a gold cube, but pray. Obviously, a magical ability. But this was maybe the most developed from ritual practice, uh, different forms of theurgy, and uh, praying and singing on hymns and so on. But you'll not really find any strict meditation practice there, I think, except for what is sometimes called noetic theurgy, intellectual or spiritual theurgy, where you don't use any material objects for this. Practice. And I think what they might have done is something very simple, uh, very similar to what sometimes called open presence, where you empty the mind completely and then you can approach the one, the source of being which is free of all qualities, through a mind that's also free of all qualities. If you go to later Neoplatonic um, philosopher Proclus, you maybe find an indication of, of what this practice was like. Um, speaks about uh, also becoming part of the divine light, closing the eyes, and being uh, established in unknown and unfortunate of beings. So <clears throat> the origin of the connection between magic and meditation is very much clear, I think. It might be the case that they actually have the same origin. I think this is, I can't go too much into this, but I think the origin of meditation might be connected to the hymns that were issued. Some uh, as a kind of prayer like practice that would also lead to some unification. But if you proceed through European history uh, with Manic in mind, we will come to John Dee and Edward Kelly. And they were doing different scrying practices, trying to communicate with the angels. Mm -hmm. Preparing for this activity was often, I think, always connected to a deep prayer. Um, for hours, you know, focusing the mind, opening the mind up. And it is as uh, it's said there is a quote by John Dee, the key of prayer openeth all things. But meditation is used, as far as I'm aware, as a word there, just this practice of focusing the mind for meditation. But if we go to Crowley, you'll definitely find this, um, specifically in uh, Book 4, where the eight um, practices you'll find this in, uh, this is from Tantra's Neo Sutras, eight spiritual practices. Um, the latter three, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi, are meditation practices as such. And this is the original lectures that the crowd had given on these practices, and they're related and integrated into um, this magical system. And it's been argued that this is pretty much the essence of what uh, Crowley did in his A. A in order, he fused ceremonial magic and yoga. Um, but if you go and read book four, you'll find a very interesting view on magic and meditation. All this is filth. Crowley speaks about the apparent abilities that can develop through meditation practice or magic. For example, it says, we find in uh, Shiva Samhita that he who daily, daily contemplates on his lotus uh, of the heart is eagerly desired by the daughters of gods as clear audience clairvoyance and can walk in the air. All this is stuff. So probably doesn't believe it. It does speak about real invisibility. Um, it says in practical life one can walk past any guardian, such as a sentry or ticket collector, if one can really act so that the man is not persuaded that you have the right to pass unchallenged. This power, by the way, is what has been described by magicians as the power of invisibility. 
So if you're confident enough, you're invisible. And this is developed further, and Crowley says that, and then there's no distinction between attitude and meditation. You might start out with different forms of meditation, invocation, but then you sort of proceed to the great work unifying with the divine realms um, and forget about acquiring knowledge, love, or wealth. Okay, um, so I think this is this has been a very influential view. If you go to more recent later books on meditation or different forms, recently developed meditation, you'll find a similar view. Maybe not that magic and meditation are distinct, but that they're very much, or that magic can at least uh, draw on meditation practice, the, sort of the potential and power that's developed from meditation practice. And this is obvious if you look to uh, chaos magic, which can be described as a pragmatic form of doing uh, magical exercises, you know, developing spells, Casting them, basically getting down to the bare bones of magic practice uh, through sigil magic practices that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. If you go to this book, uh, New Gondol, by Peter Carroll, an influential book on case magic, you will find this again that through meditation practice, through focus, focusing the mind, you can go into trance states that are very good for magic, make it more potent, and so on. Um, as he says, to work magic effectively, the ability to concentrate attention must build up until the mind can enter a translate condition, and only single pointed awareness will do. The single pointed awareness is typically connected to what's called dhyana, where the mind isn't distracted anymore, and that's where you get sort of the real uh, foundation for magical practice. Similar view from uh, Walter Thomberg in his book. Meditations on the Tarot, um, which isn't really that much about the Tarot, but it's about Christian mysticism in a way. But it does say that uh, this is from a meditation on the magician, card one from the uh, Tarot. Uh, and it says that if one wants to practice some form of authentic esotericism, be it mysticism, gnosis, or magic, it is necessary to be the magician that is concentrated without effort operating with ease as if one were playing and acting in perfect form. So I think that pretty much sums up that view, um, which again is quite prevalent. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm also an academic, so um, if I would present this sort of with a uh, traditional strict academic setting, I would be expected also to maybe argue a certain thing in this that is view. So what is the research perspective on this? Uh, there have been some studies. Uh, this one might illustrating, can it create superheroes? The answer is maybe. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's published in Frontiers, a pretty influential uh, psychology journal. An argument that the author makes is that, okay, so if you go through the traditional text, you can see that they say something like, through meditation, suffering will be reduced, and research has found that this is indeed the case. Um, pain experiences, for instance, go down. But what about these other powers? And basically, just make that a theoretical argument. We see that meditation is doing what it's supposed to do in relation to suffering, training the mind, and so on. How about researching also this other part of um, traditional meditation practice? And this isn't sort of well, it's topically related, but it's not by the same researchers. But this has been a group of um, researchers looking at what kind of uh, other things should we look to when we're studying um, meditation beyond, for instance, health effects. And they do argue that magical abilities at least seem to be reported. So if you, they asked, uh, 1,120 meditators and other experiences with meditation. One of the questions which was related to things like non physical force, physical uh, or psychic kinesis, and all, all those kinds of things like moving objects through the mind. And one third of these respondents 
So 300, 400 people said, we had experiences like this. So at least people experience it. Here's one study looking into whether they can sort of be tested in the lab setting, these abilities that develop. And um, the result was actually negative. So at least if you go to SciPass, they found that it didn't improve when it comes to the lab. But this is how research goes. You can do a counter argument there and say that the tasks aren't good enough for protecting these abilities, or the training wasn't even enough, and so on. So this is research that's ongoing, it's very much undecided, I think it's interesting, but it's not really what I do. Uh, again, going back to the, what I said initially, I really like to study things from the first person perspective, go out and do those kind of these practices. And if you want to do that, it's not always as easy, um, at least when we go deep in meditation, it's hard to find good guidance. But there have been a few meditation manuals showing up recently, like this one, highly recommended Focus on Fearless by Shala Catherine, uh, where you get instructions on how to go into the jhanas, for instance. And she also describes something very interesting that is very much close to magic, I'd say. <clears throat> it's something that happens when you're getting close to effortless concentration, so that you can start to sort of command your mind to go into that state of the art, which is. Again, effortless concentration, happiness, rapture, bliss flowing through your body, and uh, deep peace. And you can use formulas like may jhana arise, and for some reason the mind knows how to go there, and through formulating that intention alone, the mind goes there. So this is, a, for me, a very interesting case of something magical like starting to uh, appear. You can shift reality, or at least uh, do a deep shape, change in the state of consciousness for your intention alone. And the mind starts to, to listen to those intentions. Um, yeah, and this is something I've done some research on myself. This one article from Knowledge and Contemplative Universals. This is an article that pretty much explores the phenomenology of dhyana, in other words, effortless concentration. How does that arise? What does it feel like? And in particular, this instance of learning to make your mind or entice your mind to go there or through intentional law shifting into those states. And I just look back on it and I found that even the phenomenology of those states is kind of magical. It's like being in a magical realm. It's just it's how it's how it's experienced. Um, and continuing this work, this is what I want to go to, where I've started, I've started gathering some data on this. It's the levels of rapture or PT, energy starting to flow over the body. And this is from an old uh, manual, so we have five levels. Basically starts as a little bit of tingling on the body. And then it develops into one wave going through the body. And then it starts to go into a continual wave, it's flowing and flowing. And then you get a sense of elevation, like you fly out. So this might be the phenomenological source of these you know, reports about flying and so on. Um, and then it develops into the whole body being filled with energy, basically like a light pole. Yeah, and the idea there is just that to report on this to see whether that's the progression actually follows like this. Uh, and what I've discovered also is that these entities start to respond to uh, internal commands, not process at all. And the idea that this is to go through these practices to micro phenomenology on them, report them on them, and then in the end, uh, measure them to see if there's any physical correspondence to these experiences. Okay, I have some minutes left. Um, this is from the Fire Casino website. Um, I highly recommend it to have a Visit the fire casino is maybe it's a bit controversial, but it might be an uh, old practice where you stare at the light, close your eyes, and use the after image as a meditation object. And if you do this for hours and hours and days and days, you start to gain control over the color experience. And so initially it's internal, but then it starts to be external as well. So you can pretty much, for instance, shape, uh, let's say, a uh, purple ball in the air. And there are reports about people starting to 
C the same color as you are with the border shift and so on. This is really intense practice. Uh, these magical abilities, strange abilities, come after maybe 10 days. And uh, it's a really intense practice. But you can find these kinds of reports here. Uh, I, think, I think I'm on one page, and I can confirm this is a really intense practice. But it's also kind of mind blowing when you go, go into it. And I want to do some research on this as well. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little bit of a switch to the actual the combination of meditation and magic, how those can be interrelated. And what I've found is that um, these deep meditation states are really good for sigil magic. If you want to combine those two, um, these are some instructions for that. It can basically go both ways. So you just do deep meditation and use those uh, those states as a foundation for realizing an intention for the sigils, or you can do use the sigils to approach specific meditation challenges. For instance, the entrance or going into a deep state. And I'm not going to, going to go through the specific points, but it basically consists of that visualizing where you have to prepare the sigil initially, and then you visualize it, and you feel into it, and you kind of become one with the symbol. Yeah, um, so this is where I'm going to uh, end or try to summarize things. So I think magic and meditation are separate practices. Um, there is some kind of connection between them that is centered around focusing the mind, preparing the mind, for instance, through meditation going to magic. Uh, or like Carla said, you do initially maybe the magical practices and then they start to go through more through uh, towards the, the meditation practices with their spiritual goals and so on. Um, and again, a field which really hasn't been explored that much as far as I'm aware is using this is these recent develops, developments uh, within chaos magic to improve your own meditation practice. So realizing the spiritual things, for instance, uh, then those suffering and so on. Um, and again, my initial explorations of that has been, has been very good. And together with a friend, colleague, and brother, chaos magician, uh, I've started doing some, some work, some publishing on this uh, to find ones that are available now, this is a meditation book, introduction to it, a little booklet on combining those practices, and on your right to find a short manual of sigil magic. Okay, yeah, you can, you can find it out on the, the web page there. So that's pretty much what I want to say. Okay, so thank you very much.